Start investing in gold and silver at sdbullion.com today and join over 35,000 precious metals investors who have made the switch to the lowest gold and silver prices in the industry. SD Bullion recently claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500, making them one of the fastest growing bullion companies in the United States. With low bullion prices and over-the-top customer service, SD Bullion is setting the standard for precious metals transactions. Visit www.sdbullion.com today. Start saving on every precious metals purchase you make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com. And with us today is Jason Burak from WallStreetForMainStreet.com. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Elijah. I'm happy to be back. All right. I'd first like to discuss the precious metal markets. Now, since the beginning of the year, it seems like the prices have been steadily climbing. What is your take? Okay, so uh, I'm not, I have my Kitco screen up right now. We're at around 1237 gold, 18 silver. Pretty solid considering, you know, a lot of the negative research that the mainstream media have been screaming at. Uh, we had uh, basically a big short squeeze in the market for the stock markets. Uh, there was a lot of people when Trump won the election in, in the surprise that were expecting the stock markets to crash. And so uh, a lot of people were caught off guard, especially big money Wall Street people, including George Soros. And so we've had a big short squeeze in the stock market right now. I really don't think uh, it's based on fundamentals. I think in 2017, Elijah, uh, we're going to have a lot of volatility and instability in currency markets. And I think long term, that is very good for gold and silver. So, uh, yes, the U.S. dollar has been somewhat strong on the dollar index relative to other ridiculously unstable uh, digital debt based fiat currencies. Uh, and the dollar index at one point, I think, was around 105-ish uh, or close to 105. And if it would have gotten stronger than that on the dollar index, it would have started causing just enormous amounts of pain and potential collapses and defaults of emerging market corporations and emerging market government debt who have way too much dollar denominated debt. They st it, it's kind of hypocritical and kind of perverse, the situation the global economy is. You know, we have all the uh, a lot of these uh, G20 countries and emerging market countries talking about wanting to set up a new global financial system, get out of the dollar. And yet here, you know, since 2008, they borrowed just massive amounts of dollar denominated debt. But besides the point, though, I, I think, you know, all these moves in the currency markets, Elijah, whether it's a dollar against the Japanese yen or the Chinese government needing to sell their China's not selling their treasuries to, you know, because they hate Donald Trump or they're trying to punish the dollar or collapse the system immediately. They're selling their reserves, Elijah, because they're trying to save their own assets. So uh, they had they had a huge problem there in their banking system. Uh, they're actually. Uh, trying to protect their currency. Their currency was falling too fast. They did somewhat of a devaluation uh, there in the controlled markets, but they have capital controls and money was still leaving the country very, very quickly. And we saw some of this leakage uh, in the form of the Bitcoin price rising like crazy. And there's a lot of real estate purchases from Chinese, uh, rich Chinese, uh, both uh, government officials and also businessmen who have left the country. So I, I think one of the big stories, Elijah, of 2017, and this is why it's going to be important to have physical gold and silver outside of the system, also have cash in case there's a crash of any asset prices, cash for opportunities, also maybe some Bitcoin too, is that there's gonna be enormous volatility and big moves in the currency markets and exchange rates uh, because these desperate central bankers and these desperate politicians and these desperate people running the treasury departments of these economies are basically doing whatever they can to try to stimulate growth. They're coming up with these stupid uh, really stupid plans uh, in order to try to get the economy going again. Uh, Trump, Trump is the real wild card here. Uh, it, it's very interesting. We could talk about this later in the interview. Uh, I think you know there's a lot of uncertainty because of Trump. Uh, Trump is doing a lot of his campaign promises, but yet if you listen to the mainstream media, you wouldn't hear any of this. So uh, the mainstream media continues to you know insult Trump. Uh, they continue to denigrate him. Uh, and he's been, for the most part, sticking to a lot of his campaign promises. Uh, I have an article here uh, from Town Hall that I pulled up. It's called The Top 10 Accomplishments in His First Month in Office. I mean, he's killed TPP. He's put in, 
He's put in a Supreme Court justice who will follow the Constitution, similar to Scalia. Uh, he's hiring all federal outs, uh, hiring outside of the military. Uh, my favorite one that he's implemented so far is his regulation rule. So for every new regulation passed, he wants two uh, regulations already on the books eliminated. Uh, hopefully in the long term, along with some of his other measures, the tax cuts and the Obamacare repeal or however it's reformulated, once those combination of things are re-implemented, uh, I'm very hopeful that that will get the real economy going, at least somewhat, in small and medium-sized businesses and create jobs. Uh, but tr there's a lot of people just fighting Trump. Uh, he has an enormous amount of headwinds. Uh, you know, even the Republicans are fighting Trump. There's leaks within his own administration. Uh, the rumors are his chief of staff is one of the main leakers that he approved. Uh, and he obviously chose to put that guy in the cabinet because he thought he could control that guy. But he's one of the main leakers. So uh, I think, Elijah, all this volatility and these currency moves and there's just so many signs that the global economy is really not doing well. There's there's a lot of evidence we could talk about that. Uh, a lot. I mean, you could just go down zero hedge, and there's just so many examples of this, of this. The mainstream media won't talk about the examples of the global economy not doing well. They're too busy talking about how Trump's going to fix the U.S. economy, how uh, the stock market Dow 20,000. But you know, underneath the surface of the asset markets doing well, the bond market, the stock market, the real estate market continuing to stay high, uh, I see evidence that the real economy, the global economy, is not doing well. So. Uh, I, the, there's a big disconnect. And I think, you know, the asset markets are continuing, the regular asset markets are continuing to rise, and it's not really based on fundamentals. It's at this point based on this short squeeze of a lot of Wall Street people that were betting on a big crash once Trump won the election and got into office and was, people were worried that he was going to really uh, make some drastic changes and people weren't going to be able to adapt quickly to it. And uh, also uh, circling, circling around uh, I think markets don't like uncertainty, and when you look at the uh, fundamentals of the global economy, when you look at how, example of this, I have Fox News on right now on mute, and they're talking about how there's two million people in the UK who have petitioned, signed a petition, they don't even want to allow Trump in the country for an official state visit. So when you have this type of political, and I can name you know other examples of this, uh, I, I was talking on Twitter with a bunch of different people. Uh, uh, just asking the, the Gary Kasparov, the chess champion guy, he was bashing Putin. And so I was talk, I was talking, uh, he was talking about, oh, Putin's bad for democracy, just like Trump is. And I was like, you do realize that people voted Trump in, in a normal election. And then I got all these responses from people, Democrats on my Twitter handle, just dozens and dozens of tweets at me that the election was rigged against Hillary Clinton, that, uh, only dumb, stupid white people voted for Trump. Uh, and I was telling them that, you know, with my podcast and how large it is, that a lot of small and medium sized business owners who have a good education, who have had some success in the real world in reality, who are not stupid people, I've talked with them, they, they have a good head on their shoulders. And they voted for Trump because they were tired of what was, uh, you know, what Hillary Clinton was representing, and what the country had already the path it was down with globalism and high taxes and government, you know, forcing with Obamacare. And yet, you know, these insults just keep coming after and after. I also sent them my article that I wrote, you know, right after the election in November about the real reasons why Hillary Clinton lost the election. And these guys were just trashing it that, oh, that's not database. Oh, you have to quote, you know, Nate Silver at 538. And, uh, you know, these guys, Elijah, with their predictive models, None of them predicted that Trump was going to win the Republican nomination. None of them predicted Trump would have a chance to win over Hillary Clinton. He was given, I think, at one point, a 5% chance of winning the election. Even as soon as, uh, you know, around midnight at that night, the, the odds started to flip. But before that, Hillary was still drastically in the lead. And these same predictive models, by the way, Elijah, that supposedly uh, the, 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 the reality, the track record of these predictive models, this is where we get into trouble that a lot of society has been designed around these by the people in power that they claim that you know these are unobjective data points, hard data, we're doing good science here with these predictive models, these things are accurate. And let's look at the reality of these things is go back and these predictive models did not predict the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, there was bad data put in, there was things were weighted incorrectly. And you know they put in their variable at rate in, that, uh, in their uh, models there, that real estate prices would never fall. 
So they leverage to the hilt, betting that real estate prices would never fall. These are the same predictive models that have flaws in the polling. So yes, they're entering all these all this data into predictive modeling, but these things are subjective and they're weighted wrong. And what data are they putting in? These things are inherently flawed. And on top of this, when people are claiming to do hard science and great data and these models have good track records and how much data they're putting in, we have to look at reality and the accuracy of the model's track records. And these models, whether they're from Wall Street or the Federal Reserve or the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the polling data from the 2016 election predicting that Trump wouldn't win the election, that Brexit wouldn't happen, uh, that Trump wouldn't even win the Republican nomination or beat Hillary Clinton, these things are all wrong. And yet these models, people are saying they're clinging to them like a religion. Uh, that's that's the type of attitude we have now. So if you if you don't believe in this stuff, you have to have gold and silver because, you know, the people in power, Elijah, whether they're in Washington, D.C. here or they're on Wall Street, they believe in these models still. Janet Yellen, did you hear Janet Yellen's new speech? She was saying how the economy is doing good and jobs are being created. It's, it's just total nonsense. How does a Trump presidency and the fact that Trump won, how does that change, if at all, what investments, in your opinion, are good investments right now? Well, if you're a stock trader, if you're a stock trader, there's going to be more opportunities to trade uh, up and down volatility in the stock market. So there's going to be some infrastructure stocks that are continuing to do well, maybe for a short period of time. Uh, you could possibly trade long straddles on those, which are puts and calls, trade volatility. You can do that in defense stocks if you don't have any morality. Uh, you can do that in some of the other infrastructure spending and also uh, and, and also the other ideas that Trump, uh, oh, biotechnology and healthcare stocks, because uh, I think Trump is going to do very shortly in the next month or so, he's gonna have out some type of Obamacare, either repeal or fix. Uh, so I, I think that that would be potential out there for people uh, who besides owning physical gold and silver and stacking, uh, want to make some extra profits, maybe trading the markets up and down with volatility, uh, and also then maybe go and buy physical metal with your trading profits. Uh, that's not a bad idea to go out there if you're going to trade the stock markets. Uh, go out there once you have some trading profits and go and buy physical gold and silver with your trading profits. But uh, other than that, I mean, I am really, really worried about some of the things Trump has. Um, and obviously, I mentioned earlier in the interview some of the good things Trump has done, like he's putting in a Supreme Court justice who will stick to the Constitution, thank God, because, you know, if Hillary Clinton had won, she was going to try to totally destroy the Constitution. Uh, so I, I, I'm really... Uh, the the thing that scares me the most, Elijah, about Trump is the these trade wars that he could potentially start uh, with China, and China is a major trading partner of the U.S. And I don't think it's going to bring back nearly as many jobs as he's hoping. Uh, I think you know there would be a lot of robotics and automation that would be brought back, so there would be some jobs brought back uh, if Trump were to say put on a large value added tax on all imported Chinese goods. Uh, if we go back through financial history, I had Paul Craig Roberts on recently uh, a couple of weeks ago on my channel, and he was saying that the U.S. economy uh, was built on high tariffs to protect domestic industry. Uh, I really don't think from my research of history that that's what happened. I think, you know, the states all had different competitive advantages, the original colonies in the United States. And not only did they trade with each other, they also, you know, exported goods as well. There was some small tariffs on certain things. There was not sky high tariffs, like 20, 30 percent on a lot of items like what other countries have right now on some imported U.S. goods. And that does protect their domestic industries. But for consumers and savers in a free market who want a free market, obviously, we don't have a, free, a real free trade now or free markets. This is bad. Uh, you know, if there are jobs brought back with any of these value added taxes, Elijah, I think we could be looking at 20 or 30 percent higher uh, costs on a number. Not all goods, because all goods don't uh, rise evenly in the price level. There is something called the Cantillon effect, uh, where with monetary inflation or governments pulling levers with wage and price controls, that uh, prices don't rise evenly in the economy. So uh, I think, you know, Trump's going to try some type of version of supply side economics uh, going forward. Uh, the problem is that the U.S.'s debt is already much larger than the last time the supply side stimulus was tried. The last time it was done really was under President Ronald Reagan. The U.S. was still a creditor nation at that point, and it still had some factory jobs, although they were losing some of them. 
but there was no NAFTA or anything that totally gutted things. So uh, he's desperate, though, to try to figure out ways to bring jobs back. I think the best way to bring jobs back is not with the tariffs. It's to drastically cut corporate taxes, rules, regulations, make it really easy for American small and medium sized businesses to want to hire full time employees, to want to invest in property, plan and equipment in the United States. And that's what will fix things. I'm cautiously optimistic based on Trump's cabinet that he has the business talent. Uh, he's brought in some of the most qualified business people in terms of jobs in the economy. Obviously, there's shortcomings with their uh, resume in other areas. But in terms of the uh, qualifications of his cabinet being able to create a lot of jobs uh, because they've run businesses successfully, they know that too many taxes and rules and regulations makes things tougher. So uh, I'm optimistic that uh, Rex Tillerson and others will be able to create some win-win trade deals uh, individually with other countries rather than these uh, you know, corporate, uh, corporate crony deals like the TPP and NAFTA and things like that. Now, I'd like to keep our focus on the Trump administration, but kind of move it to how he's taking on the media. Just on Thursday, we saw a press conference with Trump and really just watching that. It was like nothing else I'd ever seen before. It, it seemed I just still can't believe that Trump is, you know, this is the U.S. president. And just the way he's taking on the media is just so amazing. What is your take on this? He just has so much cojones. I mean, he's been kind of challenging people like this his whole life, and it wasn't just the media. I mean, he's always had chutzpah. Uh, if you read his books, they're not really necessarily step-by-step -step guides for uh, how to negotiate really well or how to do real estate deals. They're more about how to market yourself, how to think big, uh, how, to, how to spin things if you screw up, uh, and how to uh, change the subject. So uh, there's a lot of psychology and marketing in his books. Uh, I think he's a master marketer and psychologist. You know, the stuff that happened with General Flynn, he was able to change the subject very quickly. Uh, I listened to that whole news conference that you're talking about last week. I, I didn't listen to it live. But just hearing the back and forth with him and the BBC reporter, did you hear that? You remember that specific part? That was pretty hilarious. How the guy's like, we can do that. I can do this banter all day. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to get worse, Elijah, before it gets better. So uh, basically, the mainstream media, they hate Trump. Uh, the, the, the narrative that I hear a lot from the mainstream media and the people that are hardcore Democrats and have multiple college degrees is they believe that really only stupid adult male white people voted for Trump and that because they have two or three college degrees – that they should be, uh, their vote should count more. I've heard from people arguing with me that sent me these nasty, uh, ridiculous arguments on Twitter that California should have even more electoral votes because then Hillary Clinton would have won the election. I've heard stuff like that. And I was like to the guy, well, if Congress wants to change, you know, a major law like that, if they can get a two third majority, go ahead. But I, I'm so worried, and it's not just Trump. I mean, Obama and all the presidents before have had so much executive order power that was not enumerated to them. So the president is basically becoming a tyrant or a dictator. And I'm not saying Trump is now, but I'm saying whoever comes after Trump could you know, become a tyrant or a dictator even worse than this uh, because of how much power the office of the president is being given relative to what was originally supposed to happen. I mean, Congress was given the majority of the power. Uh, they were supposed to be able to change laws, but it was supposed to be very difficult. You needed a two thirds majority vote. And, you know, Congress has really deferred all of its Congress was supposed to be the one that declares war. The president basically does that now. Uh, so Congress has basically deferred so much of its power lately. Uh, most of Congress is corrupt. They spend almost all of their time uh, trying to raise money and get reelection and looking for crony deals to pad pockets so either they can get a lobbying job later or get on a board of directors or get stock options if they're on a board of directors with a company for an IPO like Nancy Pelosi and so many of the I mean I could just name you know corrupt scumbag politicians on both sides of the aisle John McCain is a worse one uh, you know you asked me in the previous interview about the audit the Fed bill uh, you emailed me some uh, interview questions uh, that you were doing for your school paper. And I was like, look, basically, you know, the entrenched Republicans and Democrats that audit the Fed bill that Rand Paul and Tom, uh, Senator Thomas Massey want to get passed. And Trump had talked about it. You know, Bernie Sanders was fighting against it, the language of the bill, because he's a uh, hypocrite, scumbag, communist. 
Uh, we have <laughs> we we have John McCain, who's you know no one's been more corrupt than John McCain. John McCain, his first year or two in Congress was involved in abscam. He should have been kicked out then. Since then, he's just gotten more and more corrupt. Uh, there wasn't a war he didn't like. He's a total puppet for Wall Street and the military industrial complex. So he's been fighting, you know, the audit, the Fed bill. So there's so many people in Congress trying to block it. Uh, I, I'm just at the point where, uh, you know, I think the status quo is fighting to go on as long as possible. The mainstream media is one of those members of the status quo. And, uh, you know, they're trying to get Trump impeached every single day. Uh, anytime Trump sends out a tweet, they're going to spin it, make it look like, you know, he's a racist, make it look like he committed felonies. Uh, so people are going to hate him, uh, even though they don't really even look at the other argument. Yeah, Elijah, I don't know about you, but before I became a libertarian, you know, people I went to college with, people I met in my regular everyday life before I woke up after the 2008 financial crisis, I still know some of these people. And they don't trust any information, Elijah, unless it is in the New York Times or Washington Post. They are that brainwashed. And these people are not stupid. Some of them have three degrees. OK, these people are not you know, it's not like they don't care about education. Their minds are just totally myopic. Uh, they have confirmation bias up the wazoo. So they believe anything is true if it's in The Washington Post or The New York Times. And you and me were both at this Ron Paul Institute conference in September. And we heard a, a former CIA, longtime CIA agent say basically that the CIA gives articles to write directly for foreign policy and other things directly to the New York Times and Washington Post, and they print it without even making changes. And you know, if we were to tell them what we heard, they wouldn't believe it. They would say, we're fake news, we're lying, uh, you know, the Washington Post has a great reputation, the New York Times has a great reputation. Well, let's look at the mainstream media's track record. They lied about the Iraq war to get us in there, okay? They lied about the Iraq war, they, I know for a fact, Elijah, that they knew the 2008 financial crisis was close. They knew the banks were in trouble. They knew that the real estate market was close to collapsing. And that's from, you know, Greg Hunter, as well, uh, who was fired by CNN for reporting on this, telling the truth, as well as other of my contacts. Uh, they were also told, by the way, the mainstream financial media was, Elijah, more than 10 years be before Bernie Madoff was caught, they were given stacks of evidence by Harry Marco Polos, literally copies, mountains of evidence that Bernie Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme. But because the Wall Street banks like JP Morgan were getting rich off the Madoff Ponzi scheme, they didn't report on it. So, <laughs> and then look at their coverage of the 2016 election, how we know from the WikiLeaks Podesta emails, how it was not objective, unbiased, coverage of both candidates. We know that they were shilling for Hillary Clinton. Uh, there wasn't even really an apology after Hillary Clinton lost the election. I think the Washington Post or New York Times, I, New York Times, I think, uh, issued maybe a very short, brief apology talking about how, uh, you know, they were too one-sided in their coverage for Hillary Clinton during the 2016 election. But when you add all these things up, if you've been paying attention for a while, I don't think the mainstream media should have any credibility. Uh, Donald Trump recently, not only in that press conference, he did a follow-up tweet, and he said that the mainstream media is the enemy of the American people. And if you've looked at the track record of the mainstream media, you know they've been selling out to their paid advertisers, to their corporate sponsors. Uh, they've been printing government propaganda without, you know, uh, challenging the government uh, in a lot of cases on this propaganda for a long time. So yeah, they're calling. They're they're looking for every single screw up and lie the Trump administration has. But the Obama administration was full of scandals, corruption, and lies, and the mainstream media didn't really report on any of it. I mean, this this immigrant ban it started it started with the Obama administration. The list the Trump administration took it directly from the Obama administration. You don't even hear that on the mainstream media coverage. So um, the mainstream media has this narrative, this globalist, uh, progressive central planning narrative. Uh, Trump is fighting it. Also, the other thing, Elijah, is this politically correct culture. So one of the major problems with the politically correct culture is it prevents people from having, you know, a good discussion or a good debate about things because, you know, some of these topics are not safe. Some of these topics are not politically correct. Uh, you know, the snowflakes and social justice warriors of the world can't even, they have to go to their safe space. 
Uh, I think when Trump won the election, some of these uh, did your university, Elijah, the day after Trump won the election, were uh, were some of the students given a day off? Were they allowed to go to safe spaces and go uh, color with crayons? <laughs> Uh, I heard like uh, maybe other universities doing that, but I didn't hear anything about that at mine. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is the culture that we're in now, Elijah, where we can't even have a halfway decent debate or discussion about this anymore without people calling each other, you know, racist, sexist, misogynist, you know, all these other isms uh, that George Soros has paid uh, protesters for and paid for all these groups to divide and conquer us and the media matter people. So uh, this is a situation we're in now where, uh, you know, I'm seeing Facebook posts from friends asking what the fake news even means anymore. <laughs> these are not libertarian people. And they're asking what is fake news. And uh, it's not even worth responding to them because if you try to bring anything up, oh, you're already saying non-PC stuff. So uh, Trump is the first uh, non-politically correct president in a very, very long time. And because of the culture in Europe for politi political correctness, because of the culture in Canada and the United States for political correctness, uh, you know, he's despised. And um, if you actually, you know, read that uh, read that press that he was talking about, uh, the press conference, if you actually listen to it, excuse me, uh, I, I really agree with a lot of the stuff he said in the first 10 or 15 minutes in the speech. He was basically like, I inherited an enormous disaster. I'm trying, um, uh, my two main priorities are repealing Obamacare and trying to fix jobs in the economy. And, um, you know, he's going to go about trying to fix it. Obviously, I would prefer a free market oriented solution, but we don't really have free markets now because the government has taken up so much central planning at this point with uh, government spending and taxes and rules and regulations. Uh, you know, if the Democrats uh, win back both houses of Congress, it's going to get worse. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I think, Elijah, we're going to have uh, currency instability and a lot of stagflation coming forward. Uh, because I, I think there's going to be a, a big pickup in inflation. Even Janet Yellen was talking about that inflation is already starting to rise, and that's using phony government numbers that don't count anything correctly. Well, Jason Burak, thank you so much for joining us today. Did you want to share with the viewers where they can find you? And I know if you wanted to also uh, share with the viewers about, you were saying how uh, you're actually going to be moving off of YouTube because it looks like you're seeing that YouTube might actually be censoring your channel. Our channel is being very heavily censored. Uh, really, since June of 2016, our analytics across the border are down 80%. Uh, we're growing at almost 1,000 subscribers a month prior to September of 2016. We're on fire. We actually should have been over 20,000 subscribers now and over 3 million views. Uh, now we're not even growing at 100 subscribers a month, and we're still releasing quality content. Uh, I, inter uh, I did a video on this to show examples of this. But we also we have also had 100,000 uh, views from our total counter. We we're over 2.5 million views a month ago, and a YouTube just decided to remove 100,000 views. So, uh, and we're getting uh, comments and emails from our listeners that uh, they're being unsubscribed from our channel without their permission, and also that our videos, when we release new ones, aren't even showing up in their feed anymore. So, uh, I, I know your channel is larger than mine, uh, Cliff. Cliff, hi did a video about this talking about how he's seeing it in his research and mentioning our channel specifically. He mentioned your channel specifically. Uh, I could go on and on about different other examples of how uh, YouTube is censoring us. But I mean, there when our channel was 90% smaller three or four years ago, I interviewed Paul Craig Roberts and it was a lot longer interview and it got almost uh, about 9,000 views. And I interviewed him a couple weeks ago and only got a couple thousand views. So, and our channel is way bigger. So I think there's a lot of games being played. Uh, YouTube also removed the uh, Alex Jones and Joe Rogan podcast from YouTube. So they're, they're playing a lot of games with censorship. And I hear from my listeners, too, that they're also removing, uh, they're also, excuse me, uh, sabotaging and censoring not just uh, alternative, alternative media channels and gold and silver channels, uh, like you and me, Elijah, they're also doing it to select like health and fitness and video game channels. So, uh, you know, the people out there who are getting screwed over by YouTube, maybe we should figure out a new type of limited censorship, uh, free market, uh, video upload website. Someone should make a competing website who's an entrepreneur uh, or know someone with good computer programming, coding skills. There's a business opportunity there. And I think there's also a business opportunity there for someone like Peter Thiel or someone else with deep pockets 
who wants to fund a class action lawsuit against YouTube because yes, uh, they don't have to give us the ad revenue, but if they're removing subscribers without permission, without due cause, uh, I think there's something there. Uh, even though you know the ad revenue is down, they shouldn't be totally sabotaging my channel like this. It's just not right. Well, Jason Burek, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. So where can I, then our viewers find uh, you online? Uh, we, we still put up our interviews on iTunes so they could go over there. Uh, the links are all on the Wall Street for Main Street dot com website, W L L S T F O R M A I N S T dot com. And uh, we're not 100 percent sure that we're leaving YouTube yet, but we're setting up con contingency plans to leave. So uh, in the next couple months uh, that may be happening, we're not going to be leaving immediately. But, um, you know, if YouTube's going to going to take all of our views down 80 percent on every single video with these censorship algorithms, uh, we don't really have much of a choice. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your time, Jason. You're welcome.